Now, I'll show you how another part is now. Milton Shack, Dick Thornburg, Bob Casey, Tom Ridge, and Edmund Dell. I wanted to impress you that I knew all of them. In the order in which they were elected and re-elected, every one of them could go to the voters of the state, and you know what they would say? Here's the laundry list, the nine or ten things I said I would do when you elected me the first time, and 80% of them are done. Here's what I want to do if you give me another term, a new agenda. So now think of the position that Tom Corbett's in. His party controls both chambers of the legislature. If I'm re-elected, the first thing I will do is call a special session of the legislature to deal with pension reform. This is Governor Corbett. So I want you to think about this. He's, and here's what he's saying to the voters. One of my prime objectives was to get pension reform done. Is there anybody who disagrees with this? Anybody who disagrees with this? Oh, by the way, I didn't do it in four years with my party in control of the legislature. I, know, I want another four years to do it. These other, these other guys could go to the electorate and say, I did 85 or 95 percent, whatever the percentage is. This is what I did in real long. He can't do that. He wants another term to do his big agenda, which is what, and now let's throw liquor privatization into that. You all got that? Liquor privatization is something that he wants. No charter school reform. Again, I'm not suggesting that the governor hasn't been effective in getting some things done. For the most part, he talks about less spending, no taxes, balance the budgets. But the difficulty with that is every election cycle has a set of concerns that the voters have. In 2010, it was about the state's deficit. It was about, would the state be able to function? Would the state be able to deliver services? In 2014, it's different. It's spend more on education, you all follow me? It's do certain things that weren't on the table in 2010. So if you're still talking about things you said you would do in your first term, and you want another term to do it, it's tough to make the case that you had a successful first term. You all get the logic of that? It's not complicated. And what makes matters worse is that its own party controlled both chambers of the legislature. Now, they may be on two different planets, these two parties, they can, you know, the Republican Party and the, and the Senate, which is which is more moderate, consists of a lot of Republican lawmakers, senators in the suburbs, some you know, who favor gay marriage, some who want a shale tax, some who want medical marijuana. Heck, you got conservatives, you know, one of whom in this county is leading the medical marijuana charge, right? And you've got a house with Republicans that have 25 or 35 Tea Party people in who have a whole different reason for being in the legislature. They don't they, they, they don't want any expansion of government. They don't want a shale tax. They don't want, they want pension reform. They want liquor privatization. And then you have a second problem, in addition to the differences that the R's have in the House and Senate, and that is excessive polarization. The last two state budgets were adopted in the House without a single Democratic vote. This year's Republican, the, the Corbett Republican budget did not get a single Democratic vote in the Senate last year. The year before, they got six. I'm going to tell you something about this. The way it worked in the past, historically, was this. I'm in the majority party. I don't want to pass a budget, even if I can, without minority support. Don't like that. That's not good. So if I'm in a majority party in the leadership, I would go to a minority party member. If you're in the Senate for years, that would have been a guy named Vince Fumo ended up wearing either orange or stripes, whatever the heck they wear in federal prison these days. Since I've never been there, I wouldn't know. To make a long story short, the majority party would go to Senator Kuma and say, what do you want? Tell me what you want. We'll help you out. We'll give you what you want. What are your priorities? We'll give you what you want, and we want six or seven leadership votes. We want a couple committee chairs. We want you know, leaders, you give us the votes, we pass the vote, we'll put up the majority, you put up the minority. You all got that? The polarization and the partisanship is so tough, so stable, particularly in the House, 
The House sent over a liquor privatization bill without a single Democratic vote. The Senate sends over a traditional Medicaid expansion, traditional, not healthy PA, with the majority of Democrats and Republicans voting for it, to show you just the differences on some of the big issues. So the problem is that you've got these divisions in the legislature that have prevented Governor Corbett from getting liquor privatization and pension reforms, two of the three big things he's wanted passed. So an incomplete agenda is on that list of problems that the governor faces. You all got that? So now, as we're in this campaign, let me just bring this to a conclusion and we can do whatever questions you want. All right, go home. <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever works. <laughs> Here, here's, here's the situation. People are asking me, well, what's going on with Tom Wolf? He's not saying anything, he's not, you know, What's he really mean when he talks about a progressive income tax? I mean, what's that all about? What are the specifics about other parts of his proposal? And I said, do you just think that elections are about exercises in democracy? Just exercises. You know, that's the way I put that. I said, they're also exercises in winning. If a candidate has a 17-point lead, he or she wants to be missing in action. You don't want to get into a controversy. You don't want to say anything stupid. You don't want to create a needless situation that you have to go to explain. You don't want to use a number that you have to defend. You all got that? So he's playing a little rope a And right now, at this point, it's not actually hurting him. Now, Corbett's come back a little. I mean, earlier he was 20 plus down. Coming back a little, but you know, whether it's enough, enough that it remains to be seen, I don't end elections, I have a long-standing practice of not doing that. But the point I want to make here is simple. Tom Wool is doing what any candidate with a big lead would do. Do as little as possible, except doing the Fresh Start Tour, going to visit and smile and be nice, run the commercials, and he actually has more money in the final weeks of the campaign than Governor Court. In other words, the two of them will spend a zillion dollars, five, bill, five million dollars over the summer months. Now imagine this, Here's, I gotta tell you about one other story, it's pretty fascinating. The average of all the polls, the average of the poll, no, I won't give them to you that way. The poll's done in June, in June, after the primary, just before all the commercials start in July, August, and September. You ready for this? My poll, he's down 25 points. The, I'm sorry, 22 points. The Mule and Burke poll, he's down 21 points. You get it? All in the 20s. So now he's slipped, you know, Corbett's a little better. Five million dollars worth of commercials and virtually nothing changes. Now, people say, well, why, what's that about? Well, if if you know someone, uh, here's what, oh, I'd love to put it this way. Remember long ago when you were on a date? <laughs> you know, you were on a date, you met somebody for the first time, remember that? It's a, and it didn't go well. You had just met the person. And you might say, well, this date didn't go so well, so I'll, you know, I'll, I'll call her back or him back, and you go out again. And whatever didn't work, you didn't know the person that well, so if you messed up, you could fix it. But, now let's think about this. Oh, I know someone for 30 years and things haven't gone well. It's more difficult to get somebody you know well when you want to rethink who they are and what they've done than somebody you just met. Is that sort of, and here's the problem with Governor Corbett, and I'll put it now in, in political terms. The voters have three and a half years to make a judgment about it. So what he's trying to do is get them to rethink his Four, three and a half years in a half a year. And you see how difficult that is? So Wolf has had plenty of money to counter Corbett's ads, and the fact that he's had so much money and been able to counter them means that the race hasn't moved very much. Does that make sense? And the way I put it is, it's tough when somebody makes a judgment. What Tom Corbett is asking voters to do is to change their mind about him. 
after three and a half years. Not easy. Now, the other thing you can do is make a target of Tom Wolf. The Democrats, the two Democrats in the primary tried it. Allison Schwartz, the Congresswoman from uh, the 13th District, and Rob McCord, a two-time elected auditor, gen or, uh, uh, state treasurer, ran negative commercials. You know what happened? You know what happened? The more negative commercials they ran against him, the less popular they became, and the more popular he became. Weird. Because negative commercials have to pass the test. They have to be viewed by the voters as fair. They have to be viewed as credible, believable. And the voters have to care about it. I see a lot of commercials. I just don't care about what they're talking about. You know, you have to care about something. I, you all have things. If I ask you a question, you'd say, yep, no, yep, no, yep, no, right? Things that we would talk about. But that doesn't mean you care about it, right? So that's what a lot of people confuse. Just because somebody puts a message out there or gives a speech about something doesn't mean that people care about it. And so a lot of what they were talking about, the voters didn't care about or didn't believe. And as a result of that, Tom Wolf, who has 4% in the polls, about 4 before he started to run the commercials, three weeks into the Democratic primary, by the end of February or March, went from 4 to 35. He won with 58% of the Democratic primary vote. The other two candidates were like 15, 13. You got it way down. Just wiped the field out, never having sought an office before. Never ran for an office before, ran a business in York. Last candidate in Pennsylvania history who did not seek an office before he ran the first time, it took him two times to win, was Milton Schack, elected in 1970. So in conclusion, let me just say this. Governor Corbett is going to make history on November 4th, one way or the other. If he wins, he will do something that no other incumbent statewide official has done at this point in, in modern history. Coming back from a 17-point deficit, no one has ever done that. If he wins, he'll make history. If he loses, he'll make history. He will be the first incumbent governor seeking the election in the history of the state to lose. So on November 4th, we're going to have history making it.